Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Zach. Yes, it's so funny. Uh, the, a lot of Sundays, uh, Pastor Zach and I look alike. Yes, we understand that. But th there'll be some times where there was one time I was even out of the state. I wasn't even here on a weekend. I was on vacation with my wife. And I just got a wonderful call like, hey, you did so fantastic this morning preaching. And I was like, hey, thank you, you know. <laughs> I just accept it. So uh, we're just so thankful for you guys, though, always reaching out and supporting your pastors. And we love you. And uh, man, I'm just so honored that I get even to be up here. If you know me, if you know my story, man, if I, if I can be up here, God can use anybody. God can save anybody. He can redeem anybody. And so that's my story. Um, and so uh, we're continuing uh, in James. I'm picking up in James 2, James chapter 2, about our four-word series. And, and uh, you can turn there. We'll read a little bit in James 2. But um, we're going to be talking about favoritism this morning and faith in action and how those are two very connected thoughts that James presents to us. But before I get into it this morning, I want to just give you a disclaimer, kind of give you uh, uh, a perspective, if you will, um, because with our culture, with what's going on in our world, you know what's going on, I know what's going on, and all the craziness of all certain, uh, all these different things going on. And uh, I want you to hear from my heart this morning um, what, I, what I'm not saying. Because there's things I think sometimes uh, we can pick up on and maybe assume that the preacher's saying because he didn't say something. So I just want to cover all of our bases this morning. I'm going to be talking about favoritism and how we can love people. But when I talk about loving people and grace, I'm not saying forsake truth. I'm not saying just, just roll over to whatever the world's doing so we can reach them and get them in the doors. I'm not saying that, that, that we should just forget all of, uh, of truth and putting truth forward and the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible. Because you know, if, I don't know if you've seen lately, the biggest push of culture uh, is attacking uh, the validity of the Bible uh, as, all, as absolute truth. They're attacking that Jesus, it, he, they're saying that he was sinful, that he, he was not perfect, that he, he, that, that's the latest kind of push from the media, from culture. And so just our faith and truth is being attacked from all sides. You know, there's a big push saying that the Bible should be considered as hate speech, and, and, and there's just a lot going on in our world. And so I'm talking about how we love people and bring them into our circles through grace this morning. But hear me, hear me, hear me. I'm not saying forsake truth. Jesus was 100% truth and 100% grace. And we see that carried out. One of the things I love about Jesus most is, is if you see his interaction with people, he made people uncomfortable in their sin, and yet they were perfectly comfortable in his presence. It was a perfect balance. And so as I talk through the lens of grace this morning, hear me, that, I, that the truth, we know the truth must march on. We know that, that we need to carry that forward, that we're to be the salt and light of the earth. Is everyone hearing me there? We good? Amen? Great. Love it. And I'm preaching to the choir there. You guys are fantastic. And I hear all the time, even in our community, of how amazing this church is and how amazing this church and you love people so well in our community uh, and while keeping that truth. But... Let's pick up in James chapter 2, verses 1. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? We could just stop there for the whole sermon and just read that a couple times. It's a powerful verse. For example, suppose, you, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there, you can sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you this morning that you are going to lead us by your Holy Spirit into all truth, but at the same time, fill us up with the grace that brings people in. We know that, that, that Scripture says that your kindness leads people to repentance. And God, then the truth sets them free. And so we proclaim that this morning. We thank you for what you have in store. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. So I just want to break this down. James is talking about favor, favoritism, uh, you know, showing, giving people special treatment above 
somebody else. And, and let me just break that down. Favoritism, the, the meaning of that is the practice of giving unfair treatment to one person or group at the expense of another. I would say favoritism isn't something in an entity just by itself, but there's motive behind it. Like in verse 4, it says, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? And those evil motives that cause us to, f to favor people, uh, you can call that prejudice. Prejudice. And prejudice is a preconceived opinion of or an irrational attitude towards a person or a group. Those are the two, the two topics this morning. And so I want you to hear this, that prejudice is why we show favoritism and favoritism is how we show prejudice. I'm gonna say that again. Prejudice is why we show favoritism and favoritism is how we show prejudice. They come hand in hand, Being, showing favor, giving special treatment to somebody at the expense of somebody else is how we act on our prejudice, how we act on our preconceived ideas and attitudes towards certain people. See, you really, most of the time, won't show favoritism without having some kind of prejudice behind it, a thought behind the action, a motive behind the action. And, and I want to break this down for a second as we dive into this and what it means to our faith, but it's not just how we treat people. We could talk about favoritism all we want, but we know James even links it to our thoughts and our motives and what we feel on the inside towards people, not just how we treat people on the outside. And Jesus did a great job of, of changing, if you will, setting the bar to a new level when he talked about action versus thought and motive. If you think about it, Jesus said in scripture that, oh yes, it's a, we all know it's a sin to kill somebody, but then he took it one step even further and said, but if you even desire to kill a man, that's the same thing. You might as well have done it. If you, if you, uh, you know, have an affair or lust after someone, that's the, it's the same thing as if you did it in your mind. And so for us this morning, you know, for us, treating somebody differently is the same in God's eyes, in Jesus' eyes, and should be in our eyes. It's the same thing as thinking of somebody differently or how we view somebody. And that changes a lot for us because I know a lot of you in this place, you would say, I, I treat people pretty well. And I would agree with you. I think our church does fantastic at this. But there's some things that I think the Holy Spirit wants to expose as we dig, dig a little deeper is there some ways that we maybe look at people, how we think of them, our first reactions to them, our prejudices that we bring in? And uh, James brings this up because he shows that there's a connection between our relationship with God and our relationships with people. Look at that first verse. How can you claim to have faith, our relationship with God, if you show favor, relationship with people? to others. They're connected. They're very connected. In John, 1 John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. There's a direct correlation between how we treat people and how we maybe treat God, our relationship with people and our relationship with our Heavenly Father. It says in other verses, how could you say that you love God but hate somebody else? The two cannot be in the same. Jesus even said, hey, if you, if you feed the hungry, if you clothe the naked, if you, if you visit the people in prison, you are doing that directly to me. So how I treat others is directly connected in my faith in Jesus. And I can't claim to have a true faith in Jesus and have favor towards or prejudices towards people. See, the way we behave toward people indica indicates what we really believe about God. True faith in him is shown through our actions, 
toward others, loving our enemies, loving our neighbor as ourselves. See, in the next paragraph in James, I won't read the whole thing, but that's the famous, if you were to look at James 2 or think of James 2, you're going to think of the back half of the chapter, which is faith without deeds is dead. Faith without works is meaningless. It's a famous chapter, but we forget the first thought of that. The intro thought of that is James is saying, hey, don't show favoritism. Don't be prejudiced against any type of people because that's how your faith is carried out into action. How you treat people is how you show your faith. Do you have a true, a real faith in Jesus? Well, it will be shown in how you treat people. They're one thought, and we can't separate the two. That our faith is really made complete, as James says. It's made meaningful. It's made real. It's proven by how we treat and think of people. When, when, when I say, especially in our culture and our time today, when I say the word prejudice, a lot of times we think of race, specifically. The Bible doesn't limit it to race. In fact, James doesn't even mention race. He mentions rich or poor. He, he, he mentions something so different, but the Bible, if you look through the teaching of how we treat people, they mention poor or rich, clean versus unclean, sick versus healthy, uh, sinful versus righteous, a friend versus an enemy. Uh, they mention different cultures, different backgrounds, different beliefs, ethnicities. This list includes all people, all people. It's not limited to one thing. No matter what they believe, no matter what they look like, no matter what they do or they don't do, no matter how they treat you or how they treat me, no matter if they vote differently than you, it doesn't matter. All people are included in how we should not play favorites, how we should not be prejudiced, but truly love. And that's what true faith means. To love people equally, not treating anyone different, better or worse than someone else. I think favoritism is really hard for us. It's a hard thing to, to, to see because a lot of times we don't see it as a problem or a sin, much less we don't see it in our lives at all. We don't see any evidence. We would say, I don't, I don't play favorites. But let me give you this perspective this morning that I would imagine if you look at your friend circles, most of the time, I'll make that disclaimer, most of the time, your friend circle, the people that you would say are my inner circle, are people that, just, that, that look just like you, that come from the same background, culture, beliefs, religion, and we kind of in our life, we sort out who we, are, who we have in our, our, our immediate circles by a, a like me group and a not like me group. And we give bias without realizing it. We give favor, if you will, to our like me group without even realizing it. We give special treatment sometimes. Here's some ways that we give maybe favor to our like me group compared to our not like me group. I am more comfortable with those who are like me. I am more inclined to spend time with those who are like me. I'm more patient with those who are like me. I give the benefit of the doubt quicker to those who are like me. I express more grace when mistakes are made by those who are like me. It's easier to communicate with those who are like me. I assume I'll get along easier with those who are like me. And I'm more willing to go out of my way to help those who are like me. And lastly, I possess more positive assumptions about those who are like me. In our closest circles, we put people, we tend to put people around us who are just like us. Why? Because it's easy. It's easier to love someone who believes exactly like you do. I don't have to tell you that from the pulpit. We know it. It's easier. It's easier to, to love someone who acts like you, who thinks like you, believes like you, comes from where you come from, votes like you, likes what you like, is passionate. You know what I'm saying? Anything. It's just easier to love those people around us. But Luke chapter 6 says, if you, only, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to only those who do good to you, why should you get the credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money to only those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. 
and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. And you must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. So what if we love people who love us? But God's calling us to move a step further and not just love, but think and treat and feel about people who are opposite of us. And that shows, once again, that our faith is real to the world. See, James' actual definition, or example, excuse me, of favoritism isn't even treating somebody badly. His example that he gives of this rich man and this poor man is, uh, is, tr- is showing favor by treating somebody better than somebody else. Not even worse. We usually think of, if I, if I have prejudice or favoritism, I'm, I'm beating somebody down. But James says, hey, even if you treat somebody better than somebody else, that's still bad. Even if it's positively lifting someone up, but if it's at the expense of somebody else, it's still favoritism. It's still bad. So it's not just about treating somebody badly. It's, it's about treating somebody differently, different or above somebody else. See, favoritism, like I said, it's hard to catch in our lives because sometimes only loving or treating or thinking of people who are like me sometimes means that we aren't loving or treating or thinking of people who are opposite of me in the same way. If I'm only letting people in my life who are like me, that's favoritism. If I only include people in my circle or try to love or reach out to people who are like me, it's so easy to get a religious spirit and say, look at me. Look at me loving my neighbor, following that commandment, but in turn, unconsciously treating those opposite different because we're not including, we're not reaching out to them. See, Jesus shares a story to help us best illustrate this point. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And I want to just shed hopefully some new light on this with some context. And this, uh, this story is, it, 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 we love to think of it as this kind of pretty version of how to live, who we should help. We need to help people in need, and that's what we take it as. Or you could take it as, man, the Good Samaritan, you know, that's actually Jesus represented, and I'm on the road and I need him. Those are great things to pull from it, but contextually, that's not what Jesus said the parable for. He didn't. He, 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 he it wasn't just a, you know, just treat people all the same or whatever. There, there was, there was a, a whole agenda behind this story um, concerning the Samaritan race. History will prove, and you can do your research on this, there was years and years and years all the way back to the exile of Babylon in the Old Testament that the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were sellouts. They were the half-breeds. They were the mutts. They intermingled with other people groups and religions. They were, in that time where Jesus spoke this, they were religiously unclean. They were ethnically impure. They were considered second-hand citizens. See, the Jews and the, the religious leaders of the Jews, they would have these ten cultural prayers. It was kind of like, you know, an unbiblical version of the Lord's Prayer, like something that we would just recite in the morning. And there was ten of them. And one of these ten prayers actually was a, uh, a prayer that would pray something like this. It would say, God, I pray that my Samaritan neighbors would not get into heaven. Seriously, that's how culturally tense and against each other these Jews were. There was even little skirmishes of the, that caused bloodshed between them. This was a history. And so Jesus, we pick up in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is telling this story and I love, if you look back at, at culture, of, uh, with the Jewish culture, there was, this Good Samaritan story was told all the time. But it was told with the rabbi being the one to save the person hurting. It was a Jew on the side of the road, and the rabbi would come by and save him. And it was a story that they would tell kids, and they would teach in the synagogues. It was culturally known. And so I love that Jesus takes the same story that these Jews and the Jewish audience listening, specifically this Jewish uh, lawyer, this teacher of the law, and he flips it on its head. He throws a Samaritan in there that's doing, that's not the hurting one, that's not the needy one, but the one that's the hero of the story. Can you imagine the context of sitting there with that audience, with that history, how tense that moment would be? I mean, I can feel it just reading it, knowing that context. 
And I won't read the whole story for you, but you know, if you don't know, it was a teacher came up and said, hey, how do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, hey, how, what, is, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? And he said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus said, do this and you'll live. I love this part. The man wanted to justify his actions. He wanted to prove to everyone around that he was doing exactly what Moses was saying. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Wrong move. Wrong move. Jesus replied with a story. And we know the story goes, there was a Jewish man that gets beaten up almost to death and robbed, and a priest comes by and walks alongside him, and a, a temple worker or a Levite walks by and leaves this man, but then a despised, I love how Jesus says that, you can almost hear the sarcasm, a despised Samaritan comes. The audience gasps, and he helps this man and pays for him and takes care of him and personally sacrifices for a, a man that would hate him. And he treats him not with favor, not with prejudice, but with true love and sacrifice. And so picking up in verse 36, Jesus turns to this man again and says, Now which of these three would you say is a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, "Go, yes, go and do the same. This man, you could probably tell that he's fuming. He didn't even have the strength to say the S word, the Samaritan. He couldn't even fully admit it. And Jesus exposed something that I feel like we need to expose in the church a little bit about how we define who our neighbor is. If you look at the actual word neighbor in the Old Testament when they would share this proverb or, or, or share this parable, if you will, and even how it's used in Scripture, the word neighbor used in Scripture meant my fellow man, my friend. It would even go as far, they would use it in context as, say, a Hebrew, my countryman. And so Jesus takes this definition of neighbor that they would know in context. And this man, he's saying, well, who's my neighbor? And he's thinking, the fellow Jew around me, this person around me, the person who's like me, the person that I can like, the person that's easy. And Jesus goes, yeah, that's right, but your definition isn't complete. Neighbor needs to be expanded. And he says, it's not just the people who look like you, but it's the people who hate you who are your enemy, your opposite. The sad thing in a culture today, a lot of times when I talk to non-Christians and invite them to church, one of the biggest responses is, ah, there's just so much hypocrisy in the church. Say one thing and treat people another way. Doesn't the Bible say to love all people? I would say yes. I would say yes. And I believe that sometimes we can get in a mindset of Christianity that we just have the wrong definition of neighbor or should I say we have an incomplete definition of neighbor. We've just so surrounded ourselves with people that are easy or look just like us and we're showing a little bit of favoritism that might be motivated by some thoughts or feelings. And once again, I'm not talking about race. I'm talking about all people, any sort of way. Pastor Brett, would you come? Our like me group versus our not like me group. How do we treat those people? How do we treat them, both positive and negative? See, when Jesus answered the original question of this man, all the Pharisees would have nodded. Yeah, that's true. Love your neighbor as yourself. Absolutely, I'm doing that. But then the second he gave them the full definition, they got defensive, they got angry. And they, what they thought they were right in, they were actually wrong. Carry it a step further. Look at the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus gives us a perfect example of how to love people. Jesus is walking through Jericho and Zacchaeus, short man. It said he was a notorious sinner. People knew who he was. He was notorious. He was infamous. Couldn't, couldn't catch a glimpse of Jesus, so he climbs the tree. Jesus pauses and turns and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. Let's eat lunch today. I'm coming to your house. Make some brownies. And everyone is shocked in here, and people are starting to say, man, look at him. He, how, how dare he go to that despised sinner, that infamous, notorious sinner's house? People knew who Zacchaeus was. 
Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He stole money from people. He had a history. He had a past. He was a notorious sinner. He was friends and employed by the oppressive Roman government. So not only was he a sinner, he was a traitor, a thief. And Jesus, when he stops and says, Zacchaeus, that's so important. Everyone his whole life has called Zacchaeus by what he has done, by his employment, by his sin. But when Jesus turns, he calls him by name. He calls him Zacchaeus. You know what Zacchaeus means? It means pure or clean by God. Jesus looks right at this man and calls him not for what he has done, but who he can be. That's not prejudice. That's not showing favoritism. But Jesus starts to treat people based on their potential and not their past. And that's how we should treat people. Not to see them for maybe where they're stuck at or what they've done or how they think or what they believe, but who God can make them into. Because everybody has a plan. And see, Jesus saw people differently and therefore he treated people differently. See, how we treat people comes from how we see people. How do we see people? That's the prejudice, that's the evil motives that James was talking about that leads us to the action that is favoritism. How do we see people? If we truly could grasp that all people, good, bad, or ugly, everyone in the past, present, or future was died for on the cross. What their penalty was paid for. If we could just see that Jesus gave his whole life for every single person. That's what unconditional love means. Whatever condition it finds us in, we are still loved. Whatever condition. Their sins, everybody's sins have been paid for if they so choose it. Everyone we see, everyone we come in contact with, and even the people that we dislike, Jesus was the payment for them. And take it a step further, is that not that every person was just simply stopped at love, but every single person you see was made in the very image of God. That should change how you see people. They were handcrafted and molded by the Creator, by the loving Savior. And He didn't just create them, but He gave them a plan and a purpose. And take it even one step further to help you see people better is that every single person on the planet has the opportunity to have the Spirit of God dwell in them. I shouldn't treat anybody ever differently, good, bad, because that person could potentially house the very Spirit of God. They're a potential resting place for the almighty, uncreated Alpha and Omega. That changes how I see them. And we need to start looking at people the way Jesus did, and it'll help us how we treat people. We need to start seeing them, not from what they're doing or who they are, or, but, but start seeing them based on God's plan for them, based on their potential. We need to judge people based on their future, not on their past. Treating people how we would want to be treated or treat people how God treated us. Would you stand with me as I read this Psalm 103, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, starting in verse 6. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. I love that. Once again, I'm not saying there isn't truth to be had. There isn't consequences to action. There is, there, there's eternal consequences to be had. But right now in this life, he doesn't treat us as we deserve. He didn't. He sent his son. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. 
The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. How has God treated me? Not as I deserve. Amen to that. How should I treat people? Not as they deserve. Better than they deserve. Grace and blessing. Not with favoritism or exclusively or with partiality. We are the salt and light of the earth. And how are people supposed to experience this truth that will set them free if they're not in our circles? If we don't let them in our circles? If we haven't given them grace to be included? Would you bow your heads with me? I just simply want to give a moment for the Holy Spirit to speak. I know the truth does not return void. God's word doesn't. And the Holy Spirit leads us to truth. And I want him to lead us to truth right now in our hearts and minds. Is there something in me? Would it be a prayer of David? Search me, O God. Find anything that is offensive to you. Search my heart and my thoughts. Look at, let God show you who's in your circle. Is it people who look and feel and do just like you do? Maybe you need to expand your circle. Maybe you're not hating someone or treating someone badly, but you're treating some people better. Maybe it's how you just view some people. I think our nation feels so divided and so hateful. There's so many views, so many stories, so many this or that. Media doesn't help it. But how do I see those people? How do I treat those people? God, help us to love people who are uncomfortable. Help us to see, truly see people as your beautiful creation, perfectly and wonderfully made. God, and cause that, cause our eyes to be opened with everybody we come in contact with, everybody we see, everybody we, 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 we know or don't know. Would that truth about who they really are and who they can be in you, would we speak to them like a Zacchaeus, like a Jesus to Zacchaeus and not the crowd to Zacchaeus? Would we, would we lead with grace, but then God help us to stand in truth? We pray that your Holy Spirit would help us, God. We need you during this time in our nation. And Lord, you're calling us, the body, your Christians, your church, to be the ones leading the way in grace and in truth. We need your help, Father God. I pray this would not be a message, Jesus, from you that we just walk out and change nothing. But we know a true, a real encounter with you, Jesus, means change. Something shifts in us. And would you just shift our perspective, shift our actions, Lord. We want our faith to be complete in you. God, I pray if there's anybody in this place that would say, man, I've, I'm not, I don't feel included in this life. I, I, I've done too much. I'm too far gone. I pray right now, Jesus, that you would speak to who they are and speak to who you can make them and turn them into, Jesus. That you have included them in your gospel because you paid the penalty for their sins on that cross because you wanted them to have life and relationship with you. I pray that they would give their hearts to you, give their whole lives to you, and start living in the identity that you're calling them to. I pray that you'd show them your love this morning. We thank you, Jesus, for what you spoke. We praise you for it in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I pray that this week God would put some people in your path, good, bad, or ugly, that you can call out to who they are. If you made a commitment for Jesus with your whole life, I would love to talk with you. Our pastors would love to talk with you. We have a Fresh Start Center back there. We'd love to hook you up with some resources on how to love Jesus and love people. We love you, church. Let's be the church this week. Amen? Amen? Say hi to somebody on your way out. We love you. God bless you.